With all the bad news about prices these days, it's nice to know that Adam and Eve is still offering the best deal out there. Adam and Eve is your one-stop shop for everything sexy. It's got toys, games, movies, and so much more. Whether you're single and looking to impress a new partner, or you're in a relationship and you need to spice up your sex life, Adam and Eve has what you need. They've been at the top of the adult retail chain for decades, and there's a reason for that. Now my listeners will get 50% off of any one item, and that's not all. You also get three bonus sexy items and six movies for free, plus free shipping. No matter what you choose from the privacy of your own home, you can rest assured that it will be shipped to you in discreet packaging. So go to adamandeve.com, select any one item at 50% off, plus enjoy three sexy gifts and free shipping with the code HOLLY. That's adamandeve.com and use code HOLLY. You have to use my code in order to get this special deal. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. My guest today has had an incredible journey. She's been in the porn industry for just over a year when she suffered a stroke and had to have heart surgery. But she didn't let that step back stop her impressive career, both on screen and behind the camera. She's been nominated for so many awards, including Hottest Inked Star and Alt Porn Female Performer of the Year. Welcome to the show, Misha Montana. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Of I'm course. excited. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Oh, so. good. Well, I'm I'm looking forward to talking about, just as you came in the door, all these interesting <laughs> things came up. The first thing that we started discussing about, which is not on my list of questions, but I feel like we need to get into this because I want to make sure that um, you tell me all about this, is the death match wrestling that you just did that is responsible for that little cut, cut that we on see on your head right now. Yes. Well, it's, a, it's kind of funny that you even noticed it because I'm like, I have to address it at some point. It was a lot bigger a few days ago, but I'm actually part of a wrestling promotion called XPW. It's uh-huh. um, Extreme Pro Wrestling. And I got into it because I was a valet for one of the wrestlers who's actually the king of the death match. Um, so what does that mean? It's deathmatch wrestling is it's like, you know, your typical, you know, WWE or AEW. They're trained professional wrestlers, but they use weapons like obscure weapons. Um, in this particular case, I was hit in the head with a light tube like a fluorescent, like a light tube you would use in your kitchen or um, in their glass, you know, it's real glass. So they hit each other with light tubes and roll around and thumbtacks and they'll cut each other. There was a guy that used a syringe through someone's face. Um, It's so violent. It's extremely violent. And people think it's fake. Like I showed you the picture. I was like covered in blood. Covered in blood. I thought that it looks like a Halloween costume. It did. And that's what like people thought too. They're like, oh, she just like poured a bunch of fake blood on her head. I'm like, no, that's like my own blood. Like it was, there was nothing fake about that at all. And head wounds, head wounds bleed excessively. bleed. Like I was actually kind of like when it happened and I felt it on my face, I'm like, God, I hope this isn't like too much. Like I hope I'm not bleeding from my head out, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, and it's dangerous. It really is. Um, but I love it. It's such like a rush for me. Like it takes performance art to an entirely different level too. Now you said you were a valet. What does that mean? It's basically like an escort for the wrestler. Like you are their manager in a sense. You just walk out with them and kind of escort them out to the ring and you have minor storyline roles, but my role developed really quickly And that to where I ended up being more involved in the promotions and um, I ended up being more physical. We've had a few cat fights um, with Veronica St. Clair and uh, or Veronica Kane and Jasmine St. Clair. So we've had little toughs here and there. And uh, I wanted to take it to the next level physically because I wanted to show the fans that I could do it and do something as crazy as that. And no one was expecting me to actually bleed ever. I don't think they ever expected me to especially six months in to a promotion. Okay. So 
this is legal, I assume. It is somehow. Yeah. How? <laughs> yeah, like, what's the know. insurance on that? God, That's I can't what I even know. imagine. I want. I mean, and it's crazy to watch. Like you're watching it, and you're just like, this cannot be real. I think it like helps people to kind of like internalize it and digest it when you are like, no, there's no way that's real. It's entertaining to some people. It's harder for me. Like when I first watched them on TV, I couldn't watch it. Yeah. It's just like too much. It was like so disgusting to me. But when you're there and in it, you have to go in person. I recommend going in person. Yeah. Because then you get the never. whole, I'm you're never, like, no, never. I'm never. ever going to go to that. <laughs> <laughs> it's brutal. Like you have to have a certain mindset. Yeah. Like you have to be a certain type of person to be into that for sure. I love it. I'm obsessed with it. But I'm into like, I love it. Like the blood and just like aesthetically how it looks too. Like when with my blonde hair, like mm-hmm. when I got all bloody, I'm just like genuinely happy. I was backstage like, here I am bleeding from the head and people are like, are you all right? I'm like, I'm great. This yeah. is awesome. I mean, I the adrenaline this. rush must be crazy. Oh yeah, it is. It's like a whole, di- you don't even feel it too at that point. Yeah. Like people are like, how do you do that? Doesn't it hurt? Like, I mean, eventually, yeah, I hurt more right now. Yeah. than I did three days ago. So right. I'm lucky that they didn't scar up my face more than. So, yeah, I mean, you said syringes. Like, I mean, has anybody ever gotten like seriously, seriously injured from they, this? People have died from death matches. Uh, people have died in the wrestling world, you know, just from regular wrestling. Um, it's dangerous what they do. But, you know, knock on wood, surprisingly so, it's not as like common as you would think, especially considering some of the stuff that they do. But they're as trained as they can be for the most part, um, obviously using like weapons like that, there's not a whole lot of training that goes into it. You just hope that you're hitting the right places. David Arquette, actually remember him, oh, the yeah, screen yeah, guy. Yeah. yeah. He got into wrestling and he got stabbed in the throat cause they did it wrong. And he was bleeding from the jugular and has his like hand on his throat and he was bleeding to death. Like, and he like caught himself cause it's a performance. He left the ring because he's bleeding out. He knew he nicked something. And he turned around and went back in to finish the match. Wow. And that's how, like, you okay. know, they are dedicated to this, no to shit. that level. So, all right. I'm sorry. I can't, like, wrap my fucking brain around <laughs> this. So, um, <laughs> it's so obscure, I know. I, I didn't know that this existed. Um, so you say that there's training and you said that somebody stabbed him in the throat wrong. Yeah. I'm assuming that there is some training around the appropriate places to impale somebody right and okay. like you know a lot of it too is kind of like common sense and you know a way they they're not trying to like really hurt each other you know for for the most part there are right. some people that are probably trying to hurt you but there's a respect between opponents you know uh-huh. it's just like any other event it should be especially with something that personal too where they're so close to all these vital right. organs and things like you're not trying to hurt somebody and everything that they're doing they are okay with, you know, or Mm -hmm. they want, or they're communicating in some ways that people wouldn't even realize. So, you know, it's not just like an all out brawl, like we're going to go out and I'm going to try to stab you to death. Like that's Mm -hmm. not how it is at all. It's, you know, it's executed in a way that that doesn't happen for the most part, but accidents happen. It's just like anything else. It's like hockey, you know, they get the, their throat slit from weight. It's like, yeah, my if husband you, you know. plays hockey. It's oh, does he? See, yeah, hockey's brutal too. Brutal. Like <laughs> watching hockey matches, I'm like, man. And they and the fighting is like the part that everybody, everybody loves, loves the most. Yeah. Oh, it's crazy. I wanted to play hockey when I was in second grade. Yeah. And my dad was like, no chance. No, my husband's totally gonna teach my daughter how to play. Hockey. Oh no way! Yeah. Oh, for, oh, good for you. Yeah. I love it. I think it's great, but yeah. it's brutal. Like it I don't know brutal. how people just they just love it, but then people wonder like I'm nuts for liking you know, wrestling. And then I watch hockey. I'm like, this is so brutal. I mean, but they're like padded and <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. To, like, to be fair, like there's some protection going on there, but with yeah, there's none, the, there's none. Like people don't wear like bulletproof no. vests or definitely not. They're like nothing. shirtless for the most part. Like they're just all out. Like they, you have to have a certain like mindset to even want to do something like that yeah. for sure. Yeah. I love it. I think we're nuts, but I think everyone thinks that too. Do you so. think that it's actually like a good outlet for people who have like a lot of pent up aggression or anger to get it out in like a healthy, um, consensual way? Yeah, I really do. I think that, um, you know, physical sports like that, especially ones that are, you know, more like aggressive and mm-hmm. brutal and physically violent like mm-hmm. that. I think it is a good outlet because who knows, like if you like are having those kind of feelings and, you know, 
you're raging out like that in a ring, what would you be doing if you weren't mm -hmm. there? So I think it is like a healthy expression too. And it really mostly is like an artistic expression for the most part, mm -hmm. but it is a phys very physical expression too. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of it too is there's so much pain incorporated into it. It's almost like a BDSM kind of parallel mm -hmm. in a way. Like you almost enjoy that pain and it's kind of a release. At least in my opinion, I think that's part of it. I don't know because I can't speak for a lot of the other people involved, yeah. but I could see that being kind of playing into that a little bit. Yeah, I know so. that totally makes sense. Which is why I like it. I mean, I'm into, you know, that kind of pain pleasure relationship. Yeah. So I, I can see that playing a role also. That would be my suspicion. Yeah. How do they choose the weapons? And do I'm assuming the weapons have to be approved by a board or something like that? Well, I mean... Because you can't come in there with like a fucking club with a bunch of nails in it. You could. Oh, Jesus Christ. You could. <laughs> Fans will bring weapons like, that they make. And I'm like, that stuff I don't trust because I'm like, I don't know. Like, I mean, I, the fans are great. I love the fans. But like, you don't know what somebody did to them. You don't know. Like yeah. somebody brought to one of the shows like a pinata with a bunch of razor blades in it. Like that's sketchy stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, no, they, I mean, they really, if you think of it, they probably put it through their body like skewers, like long skewers. They like shove them in your head and... I don't do that. That's not my level, but like that's gnarly what they do. But I assume, okay, so the other contestant has to approve the weapons, right? Like you can't, like two people are fighting each yeah. other. Yeah. So do yeah. they approve it like at the event before be it like, starts or is there a communication before? There's communication for sure. Okay. So they're like, um, hey, I'm going like, to bring a fucking machete and it's right. like, that's cool. No, it's a little much. Yeah. Or that's. You're like that's a little much. They like <gasps> weed whack each other sometimes. Like wait, with like a like weed a weed whacker? whacker with a motor. Oh yeah, get the fuck out of here! I know. It's crazy. <laughs> like I'm telling you, anything you think of that could be used as a weapon that's like dangerous, they probably have used it. No chainsaws. I don't know about chainsaws. They might have used chainsaws. But I think chainsaws are too much. Yeah, weed whacker is a little. <laughs> it's not we're not going through the log we're going through like the brush you know yeah 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 um no it's it's but still like who wants to get intentionally cut by a weed whacker nobody well clearly them. somebody does yeah. because otherwise this wouldn't exist small percentage of people want to get whacked by a weed whacker that like, is nuts okay is, so how crazy. many how like big are these events how many fans are generally there they're usually you know a couple hundred few hundred people there um the pay-per-views sell like crazy though. Like in-person events, usually like a few hundred, but I can't even imagine like thousands and thousands and thousands that they sell on pay-per-views. So people are watching it from from home. It's a, definitely like it's an indie promotion, so it's smaller, way smaller than right. the main, and it's obviously a niche thing. Yeah. So it's not appealing to everybody. Like it's not a mainstream appeal. But it has, like, a really large fan base, and it's very, like, cult-like, mm -hmm. you know? Like, everybody, they're really into it. Oh, like, I can imagine. And it, it's awesome. Like, I'd say, like, wrestling fans compared to, like, porn fans. Because like, I thought porn fans were, like, uh, they're serious. They're yeah. obsessive. But wrestling fans are rabid. Like, yeah. they're so connected to it. Like, it's just like porn. And there's a lot of parallels between porn mm -hmm. and wrestling, like, mm -hmm. if you think about it in a mm -hmm. lot of ways. So um, to have that comparatively like fan base wise it's really interesting because these fans are like diehard if they hate you they they hate you and but if they love you like it's amazing so these fans are, are incredible and because it means so much to them too mm -hmm. you know and wrestling fans are like that like you either get it or you, you don't at all yeah you know yeah. but if you get it you have like loyalty forever yeah with these people so and I, I love it i'm obsessed with it it's interesting that like you're straddling these two worlds that appeal to like our mm -hmm. most animalistic and to be fair strongest instincts mm -hmm. violence and sex yeah 100 percent. so what are the parallels that you see between them and, and how are they different maybe well you know i've always seen it as like one degree of separation between the two where mm -hmm. we you know we were both in these worlds that are fantasy worlds Everybody is a character. I relate a lot to the wrestlers and the wrestling community because I understand what it's like to be a fictional character mm -hmm. for the most part. You know, some people are not, but for the most part, mm -hmm. right? You know, you're playing a role, a fantasy role. And, you know, you have this struggle with identity a lot too, where mm -hmm. you have a real life. You, you know, you're a human being, but yet you're supposed to be this figure all the time. Mm -hmm. And 
I think, you know, wrestling is one of those worlds where it's like the most relatable in any kind of a professional sport or anything, really. I mean, other than obviously like actors and actresses, Mm -hmm. but they get to like maintain a lot of their, you know, privacy and they can separate from their roles where we can't. There's a blur between our real self and our fictitious self. So, you know, th- there's a lot of parallels there, but it ultimately, like, it's a performance. Um, and you have a lot of people that can't separate performance from reality. So it's interesting. I, you know, and actually, I think there's more similarities than there are differences in that world, too. Highly physical, mm-hmm. um, physically demanding, emotionally, mentally demanding, mm-hmm. um, stigmatized in some ways. Obviously, wrestling is more widely accepted socially mm-hmm. than the adult community, but there's a lot there. And I think it's kind of interesting when you combine the two worlds too, which is Mm -hmm. what this promotion does, combines the two. So brilliant in my opinion. And if you think about it, it makes sense, but you would probably never put those two eggs in the same basket. Mm -hmm. Like if you weren't actually, you know, familiar with either world. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of an interesting, interesting thing to watch. Why do you think the public has an issue like, separating the character from the persona in sex work and in like wrestling versus because you compared it to acting before. Uh Why do you think that there there is that struggle to like separate those things? You know, I think it's investment in the the characters. You know, I think people are so desperately looking for an escape, especially these days. You know, we live in such a hostile, negative world and seeing people like us or seeing these, you know, and wrestlers are like, they're built like Greek gods for the most part. They're superheroes, like especially to children, you know, they're a figure that it's a living, breathing fantasy. It's obtainable Mm -hmm. in a sense where like you see movies, you're like, I'm in love. You know, you can get obsessive about certain fantasy, you know, even like science fiction storylines and characters, but we're physical representations of something potentially attainable too. Mm. Um, and I think that people like fall in love with that idea. You know, there's, there's a hope there that they can relate to, or, you know, it kind of embodies like their fantasy, mm-hmm. just living, breathing, walking fantasy for them. So I think that attachment is greater, especially like I was comparing it to, it's different than a football team because it's like, you know, you people are diehard loyal fans to their teams, but we're like individual characters with stories, with mm-hmm. personalities, with social media presences, with things that they can follow all day, every day. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's the fan base gets deeper and more connected because you are an individual. Mm-hmm. And even if you are just that character, I think that's why they have a hard time separating the two because they don't want to. Mm-hmm. I think when you, you know, and I've been cautioned to this before, not to share too much, to give it too much reality for fans. Um, I honestly disagree because I think my fans like that about me, I would hope. But I can see why it wouldn't be endearing. You know, they want the fantasy. They want you to be what they see on the screen. And to them, that's that's what matters. So, but it's difficult because at the end of the day, you are human. That's why so many people, wrestlers and porn people alike, you have mental health problems. You have substance abuse problems. You have identity crisis, like at some point or multiple times in your life. Yeah. Because of that, you know, you're treated a certain way and viewed as this object, you know, this fantasy figure, but you're a human at the end of the day, whether they want to acknowledge that or not. It's been interesting because I've seen feedback specific to that actually on this podcast. And I've had so many people tell me you, your show humanizes adult stars. There's one side that says, I can't watch this girl's porn anymore because now I see her as a person and like you've ruined it for me. (laughs) Sorry. Um, And then then there's other people who become more of a fan because they're like, I didn't know that she had these depths to her. Mm -hmm. I relate to her on all of these things. I see her as a person now. I'm an even greater fan. So it's kind of interesting. And I think that also separates out the two different kinds of fans. And I think that the rise of OnlyFans and other personal content platforms has really illustrated this. There are some people that truly like watch porn because they just want to get off. They want to masturbate. They want to like blow their loads. They don't get prostate cancer. 
should masturbate Good frequently to yes, not get do. prostate cancer. <laughs> it's important to get that sperm out. Just saying. Get it out. True. Get it all out. Um, and then there's people that are truly um, looking for a connection mm-hmm. with somebody else. And um, I think sex workers, because they also like put themselves in this vulnerable position of like showing themselves to the world. Um, and now that people have access to them through the internet, uh, they feel this, this connection with these people. Mm-hmm. I think also too, especially since it's more difficult for men to have sexual relations than it is for women. And it's been really interesting for me to talk to some fans that are, um, you know, who hire like, uh, full service sex workers Mm -hmm. or, um, you know, do in-person sex work or, or just like big fans of whoever and support them on OnlyFans and order lots of customs, et cetera. Um, and you know, they've provided really interesting insight into like, I have a hard time having relationships with women sometimes. Some of them are married Mm -hmm. and they have a hard time connecting with their wife and they feel like they're getting a connection through these women and there's not that judgment that they fear and they experience with like the dating pool. Right. Well, you know, I think that that brings up, you know, the biggest human issue is that we're all looking for a connection. Yeah. And more than ever, we lack it Mm -hmm. in every way. You know, the with technology and social media and these apps for crying out loud. I mean, you can't even meet somebody organically or in person anymore. And half the time you talk to someone online, you meet them in person, you're like, this isn't even like the connection I thought it would be. It's awkward because yeah. we've, you know, unfortunately as a species gone into this weird thing where we crave that connection and we have to have a physical connection with human beings. We're meant to, we're biologically engineered to have that connection. And I think the problem you combine that problem with this stigma around sex and the human body in general, and then especially, you know, sex work where it's so taboo and frowned upon and especially, you know, religiously or whatever it may be. And again, you are, at the end of the day, a biological sexual being. We're all products of sex. Um, Most of us will have sex at some point in our lives. So to shy away from that and to shun it, to shame it, that creates these issues when we should be having open discussions and education and, you know, acknowledging that we're all human beings. We all have these urges and desires and how to deal with them in a healthy and appropriate way. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think it's just lacking all across the board, but that desire and that need is there. So it makes our job and sex workers alike that much more valuable too, Mm -hmm. um, because the services that we provide are essential, Mm -hmm. you know, to, you know, maintaining that humanity, whether it be connection or physical, you know, physical or emotional or whatever it may be, just talking to someone, you know, can be a connection. Yeah. So I think we desperately need more of that connection and more of that education, probably more than ever. Yeah. I think partic- about this one particular, um, I think he's a Patreon member. I know he was um, at least for a while, but I don't know if he still is. And we had this interesting discussion about, you know, you hear that so often, like, oh my God, why do you watch porn? Like, you're so pathetic. You subscribe to this girl's whatever platform. Go get yourself a real girlfriend. And this guy was like, I'm handicapped. I'm in a wheelchair. He's like, how easy do you think it is for me to date? He's like, I can't meet women. Women don't want to date me. I know it's very easy for the able-bodied man who doesn't necessarily have such a hard time dating. But like for me, this is very hard for me. And sex workers provide a really valuable service for me. And yes, I'm paying them for their time, but it doesn't mean that I, they don't, I don't feel that they care for me. I have a therapist. I pay her for her time, right, but that doesn't services. mean she doesn't care right. about me. Right. But that's her job. Yeah. No, that's an interesting, interesting point too. It's like, and you know, why are we so eager to judge other people for, you know, something that they're doing in a responsible and healthy way for their own well-being and mm-hmm. happiness, you know, but people that say things like that, they probably aren't getting as much pussy as they're, you know, letting on to for one. <laughs> yeah. It must be so easy for you having pussy thrown your way 24 seven, especially yeah. when you talk to people like that. Yeah. Um, but you know, insecurities and all these other things, but it's just, that just goes into the whole thing of it's a necessary service for, for people. Like, and it shouldn't be shamed. Like, yeah. I think that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And for somebody to feel that way, to feel loved and appreciated, whether it's paid for or not, it's real to them. Mm-hmm. And that experience is valuable. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, 
those experiences should be celebrated and not shunned or judged or shamed in any way. Yeah. I mean, I think it's also this idea if there's a monetary exchange there, then the service that's provided isn't genuine. Right. Which is, I think, a weird thing. Like I'm, so I'm paid to do photo shoots by doesn't clients. That doesn't like mean it. I don't love it. It yeah, doesn't mean exactly. that, like I'm not enjoying myself and like I'm, I'm passionate Forced and I'm committed. To do it. Yeah. yeah. But like, this is, I mean, we live in a capitalistic society. Like we need to right. make a living yeah. so that we can like pay it's our bills normal. because right. unfortunately, you know, shit ain't free. Right. So if you decide to make a living by providing intimacy, such, you know, um, coordination with other people, like, yeah. Why are we so quick to jump to that and to shame that? Yeah. It shouldn't be. And it's, you know, prostitution is the oldest profession in the yeah. world, you know? So, um, no, I really think that it, we need to have more open conversations and especially going into legal conversations, you know, mm-hmm. we'll see what happens in the near future, but we're potentially looking at some seriously aggressive anti-sex legislation coming yeah. forward. So these are problems too that, you know, people are like, oh, well, I don't hire prostitutes. Why do I care? But you'd be surprised like how many people within your community are, we're all part of an ecosystem that you are also a part of. I mean, mm-hmm. and if you strip away our rights and you don't think that it's going to happen to you, you are very wrong. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a slippery slope. It is like, and censorship in general, you know, it's like you root for somebody to get censored that you don't agree with or happen to like, but be careful doing such things because it's dangerous and problematic for everyone Yeah, when that overreach starts happening. Cause you know, it's all fine and great when somebody doesn't, you don't like gets hit with it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's two-sided. It doesn't just, you know, leave you alone. So no, I think, you know, um, legalizing sex work nationally should be a priority. Um, That's always been my opinion on it. I think it should be safe and regulated. And it's just like marijuana. You know, remember the anti-weed campaigns? Mm -hmm. Like, holy, (laughs) you will smoke and die or murder your whole family. And now it's like- Remember the D.A.R.E. campaign? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God, yeah. That didn't work. Yeah, like, like, you're going to take ecstasy and it's going to burn a hole through your head and you will croak on the floor. And then you take ecstasy and you're like, I didn't die. Yeah, and it it completely, like, eliminates- It undermines everything everything that that you you told you. So that's why, like, having education, like, not this, like, fear-mongering based, like, structure. It's like, have an honest, like, conversation, like- Honestly, you're going to love this shit, but just don't get addicted to it. It yeah. is dangerous, you know? Yeah. But, like, why lie and try to... Because it's same with sex. Like, don't have sex. You're going to get AIDS. You're going to, you know, yeah. all these things. Like, it's like, okay, well, you have sex, right? Mm-hmm. That you've had sex. So how do you sit there and say it? It just totally undermines their agenda completely. If anything, it pushes people into, like, a more radical, like, side, potentially. Yeah. Because now you're like, well, fuck this. If everything they said was you know, untrue about that, then it's probably untrue in other ways too. Yeah. So, and that's where you create recklessness too, you know, that defiant recklessness. So Mm -hmm. I think education is the most important thing and we're seriously lacking it in many ways. Amen. All right. uh, We're going to take a quick break so I can (laughs) educate you on my sponsors and things that you should buy to support this show. (laughs) Buy it up, (laughs) buy it all up. (laughs) So uh, hang tight guys. We'll be right back. With all the bad news about prices these days, it's nice to know that Adam and Eve is still offering the best deal out there. Adam and Eve is your one-stop shop for everything sexy. It's got toys, games, movies, and so much more. Whether you're single and looking to impress a new partner, or you're in a relationship and you need to spice up your sex life, Adam and Eve has what you need. They've been at the top of the adult retail chain for decades, and there's a reason for that. Now my listeners will get 50% off of any one item, and that's not all. You also get three bonus sexy items and six movies for free, plus free shipping. No matter what you choose from the privacy of your own home, you can rest assured that it will be shipped to you in discreet packaging. So go to adamandeve.com, select any one item at 50% off, plus enjoy three sexy gifts and free shipping with the code Holly. That's adamandeve.com and use code Holly. You have to use my code in order to get this special deal. All right, guys, we are back. So uh, let's let's do your origin story. We got to deal with every guest. How did you get into porn? You know, I started in the adult industry when I was 18. Mm -hmm. I started modeling, doing fetish modeling mostly. Started in the BDSM community. 
And I was in and out, like not seriously committed to actual like film porn, like hardcore porn for about 10 years. Like I actually got into it and decided to do it when I was 29. Um, and it, then COVID obviously came around and that was a lovely experience for all of us, of course. But, um, I've actually only been in, I would consider myself in the industry now for almost two years, Mm -hmm. which it seems like so much longer. I've been in and out of adult for about 11, Mm -hmm. but yeah, industry, I've only been in about two years, which is wild considering all the things that have happened in two years. Wow. It's crazy. Wow. And so, um, so how, like, what was your transition into doing like what you're doing now into film? So what did you not shoot your first porn scene until 29? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I didn't shoot my per- first porn. Yeah. Porn scene was, uh, when I was 29 and I was already 29 years old. I mean, that's when most people like would be retiring essentially. So, and everybody thought I was crazy for doing that. Luckily in this new world that we have with the internet, like, the genres just kind of are limitless. Mm -hmm. So um, it worked in my favor in a lot of ways. And I tried to get an agent. I didn't know how to do it. I mean, how, you know, like when, you know, the people that DM you all day, get me into porn, please help me into porn. I don't even know how I got into it, to be honest, because I was trying to email, call, reach out to agents. I didn't know anyone in the industry for the most part. You know, I didn't have any connections. I didn't know what to do. So I did it the old fashioned way and started emailing people and finding their contact information, DMing them to 95% of which were unanswered or told no. Mm-hmm. Um, I, every single agency that I tried to get with in the beginning, and I had far less tattoos at that time, mm-hmm. was not interested because of my age and because of my tattoos. And then Alterotic, I emailed and I was like, that was kind of the last one I was going to do. I'm like, you know what? I really wanted to do this. I gave it the best effort that I could this is kind of it. Like I'm exhausted from trying at this point. So I was feeling really defeated when I sent that email. And the next morning, 7 a.m., I jumped on a three hour long phone call with Ivan. And the rest of that is history. I ended up shooting my first scene with them with Sasha Inc., which was amazing. Um, And I ended up now I'm their production manager and only female director, writer, producer. So it's great. I'm kind of the unofficial contract star as well. So mm-hmm. um, it's great. I've gotten so many opportunities with them. I love being with them and representing them. So I was blessed in that sense. You know, mm-hmm. I was given the gift of opportunity and I just wanted to show everybody that I could do it. And I'm, I think we're doing it. So. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you're obviously like, inked mm-hmm. pretty well inked i actually keep staring <laughs> at this, this one, one? This, one? That, I know. this is the one everybody likes that too. one is so like crazy. really beautiful it's crazy it's incredibly it's well amazing done what they can do I'm not, yeah i'm not an artist myself not in that way um speaking of incredible tattoos can we please talk about your alien <laughs> the one. pussy yes, tattoo because wow i <laughs> i looked at it she because i my uh, my producer like uh, wrote out all these questions and she was like, you have to see her alien <laughs> tattoo. And I hadn't <laughs> looked at it yet. And I mentioned it to Misha and she's like, you got to see it. You have to see it. I'm and more- I was like, okay. <laughs> I was like, I'll go online and I'll oh look at the God. link. Cause Holy I wasn't about shit. to ask her to like get naked right now. Cause I'm a fucking professional. lady, professional lady. And I'm not weird like that. So I just looked up her vagina online with her sitting right here, which is not weird at all. No, not, at all. not for us. No. Um, and, um, yeah. I like it's a, it's it it goes all the way down just so people know it's not like just right above here in the pubic no, it's area it's, it's the entire on thing the lips, everything and it's got like tentacles Teeth. yeah it's and a you one. got it in a very interesting way I did and I actually came up with this idea because people are like what the fuck where did this come from originally I was like I wanted to do because I wanted to do tentacles of some kind mm-hmm. I was like well the octopus things played out um I first it was a jellyfish but I'm like I'm so into like I'm such a nerd at heart too I'm like oh my god I was driving and I almost like crashed my car because I was like it has to be a face hugger how cool would that be because in the movie it's from alien you know right, so they right, right. jump on your face and I'm like yeah. if it's on my pussy then I can sit there and like suck people's faces off with my pussy so it was perfect yeah but we we ended up doing it for the live um we live streamed during covid the avn awards had a red carpet so on the red carpet we threw this party and it set up at the studio there were about 15 people there and we were streaming it and it was like a six hour long tattoo and it was the most god-awful i did a blow bang right afterwards actually 
It was nominated last year. You're not fucking around. I was, you were I was like so hard committed. on this. <laughs> I did a bobing after doing a six hour long, horrifically painful pussy tattoo. Did it the was, did the blow bang help you forget the pain? It did. Okay, that's I think good. my performance was actually pretty good considering that I had just done that for so long. Like that was the last thing I wanted to do. But I was like, was it blow bang? Yeah. Oh yeah. After that, I was in so much pain. Well, whose idea was it to do the blow bang after the tattoo? You know, good question. I don't remember. It's probably mine. Honestly, <laughs> you're like I'm, I'm gonna get like a really <laughs> intricate like, six out. Did you have you had you must have had an idea of how long it would have take, right? The yeah, tattoo. You know, I didn't think it would be that long. Okay. I don't. We really didn't think it was gonna be that long. Um, but why I, did it take there, so long? Because there's all these folds so much detail. detail oh, the details are like there was so much detail, and because it's like, on your lips too, it's, right? Every, yeah, it's all so the way in. Did he have to stretch your lips out? Yeah, to, like, get, it like. The, honestly, the worst part about it was like this big tendon that runs into your from your like inner thigh up to your like hip. Mm-hmm. For some reason, when he hit that, I was like, <laughs> like I mean, it was worse than giving birth. Like, and I was bawling, crying. I've never lo- really like cried during a tattoo. Like, I mean, it hurts, but you get over it, and it's usually not as long lasting. But man, there's so many nerves and stuff down there. Like, and this is a serious tattoo. It's not just like, oh, there's a palm tree. It's no, lit- and like over and over with the detail. And I was numbed out and everything, and it was nothing. It was gonna help that situation. Dude, the way they use numbing cream, they did. And I was like sitting there baking with my little saran wrap, like, you know, getting all moist and ready to go. And I'm telling you, there's nothing in the world that could have like made that, <laughs> made that enjoyable. How did that, t- did the artist like respond? Like when you were like crying, was he like, oh, he, they, I know he felt bad, you know, yeah, and he was say. like trying, he told me to, he was like trying to hurry and like, but you know, they're also like. But it's like, if job. you're going to do a vagina tattoo, yeah, like you don't rush do that. Don't fuck that up. Oh, he, this uh, Jojo who did it is an incredible artist too. I mean, it's photorealism too. Yeah. It's not just like, no, it's a know, really well worm. done tattoo. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I was so happy with how it turned out. But then I think like when it was done, I was so happy that it was done and I was so stoked on it that I was like, Fuck yeah, let's do a bow bang. Let's do it. Let's <laughs> yeah, celebrate. Gentlelman. Let's get it done. I was amped at that point because I'm like, thank God it's over. Like, I have all this energy now just sitting there like this for like, like six hours. What can like, I do with this energy? <laughs> uh, blow several guys. Yeah, let's do it. Let's just like get all, you know, <laughs> celebrate, get all your fucking loads on me. Like, let's do it. Oh my God, that is crazy. <laughs> it was. It was crazy. That was wow. crazy. Wow. I like tend to do crazy things. It seems like that's a pattern. Yeah, I, that's the that's the impression I got kind of <laughs> right off the bat. <laughs> yeah, I am crazy. <laughs> so um, let's talk about your stroke. I did have a stroke. Tell us <clears throat> how did that happen? What was the recovery like? I had a blood clot um, that unfortunately traveled to my heart. I didn't know at the time that I had a heart condition that was previously un, um, undiagnosed. I had a, what they call a PFO. Mm-hmm. So it's a hole that you develop. You know, most people, when they're born, they all we all have a hole, but it closes, it compresses, shut. Um, yeah, they actually, so when my, I was pregnant with my daughter, that oh, was something really? that they, they were concerned about. They were concerned about. They did a fetal echo uh, scan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and they said same thing. They're like, it'll probably can, close. They usually own. do. Mm-hmm. And they checked her after she was born and she was fine. See, yeah, but th- back then, I don't even think of, that oh, technology sure. existed. No. So like a lot of people are walking around with these things. I had no idea. Yeah. And so it, because of that, it drew the clot into my heart and shot it up into my brain. And unfortunately, that meant that I suffered a stroke. At the time, um, I didn't really share this information for a while, but now that it's out there, I was actually having sex at the time. Um, And it was like the weirdest thing because I was like having sex, full blown having sex. And, you know, I'm like, you're dirty talking and whatnot. And my voice was weird and I couldn't talk. And I was like, this is weird. And so we're like, we get done and sure enough, like the whole side of my face is gone. I'm like, my hand tightened up. I lost all control of the right side of my body, basically. And I couldn't talk. And the guy I was with was like, are you on drugs? Because it's like, it's so shocking. Like you, yeah. and that's what like is unfortunate about strokes is that it, people think it's like funny or that people are being like drunk or incapacitated, you know, drug use, whatever. Um, when you're having a serious medical emergency happening yeah. to you. 
And when uh, the news anchors are online and they stutter and those kind of things and people are like, what the fuck is going on with them? And it's like, well, they're suffering a stroke, you know, but with strokes, it's interesting because they're so subtle though. It's not painful. Hmm. Well, to me, it wasn't, there's nothing really indicative of having a, like, this is a really serious issue. It's so subtle that you could brush it off, which is what I did. I didn't think I was having a stroke. I thought, I almost thought we had Mexican food earlier in the night. And I was like, maybe I have an allergy. You know what I mean? Like something, I knew something was wrong. Yeah. I mean, a stroke, I feel like wouldn't be the first thing that would come no, to mind. No, well, like you yeah. Google and it's one of those times where you're like, Google this. And it says, go to the hospital immediately. You're like, get out of here. Get out of here, women. Yeah. yeah okay, Google. Like, I, I'm not dying from like, you know, the, yeah. like, it's actually you are, you know. Yeah. Um, I didn't go to the hospital until the next morning and I drove myself. Uh, about two and a half hours to the hospital Jesus. with one hand trying to drive. Um, and I walked into the hospital and it was COVID time. And I will never forget. I walked in and they're like, you know, why are you here? And I took my mask off and I didn't even say anything. And they started ca- calling like stroke codes yeah. over the, and yeah. I was like, it's not, we, like, do we have to yeah. really like, it's, it cannot be that serious. Yeah. And it was, um, and I was in the hospital for about a week. I, went through serious speech and physical therapy. Um, I'm lucky, like it's a day and night difference from what it was a year and a half ago. Mm-hmm. My The fact that I can even talk, walk, do anything that I can do to this day is a blessing. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some serious long-term consequences that I will have for the rest of my life. Um, unfortunately, I still have a speech issue a little bit, but my memory is completely obliterated. I have a really hard time remembering even just like little things like scheduling is a nightmare. And I'm so like, I'm such a perfectionist about my brand and like, oh, it's so frustrating. I like, I'll go to the airport. I did this the other day, went to the airport on the wrong day at the wrong time. And I was just crying because I'm like, you know, it's just like stuff like that where it just bothers you because it's like, and I know what it's from. And it's just like, sometimes that stuff happens. And the fact that people, you know, I've recovered so well too and, People are like, oh, yeah, you had a stroke. Like, you're good now. You look great. You sound great. And it's like, that's true. Thank you. You know, and I appreciate that. But it's like underneath there, there's so many Mm -hmm. like issues that are I think about it constantly because I'm constantly having to deal with it and having to like almost go above and beyond what I would normally do to just try to make the appearance that everything is like normal too, Mm -hmm. in a way. Um, It's very difficult. It's draining to do. But do, the, do you think that you will have these um, memory situation problems forever? Probably. Or do you think that there's no like therapy that? Not really. They kind of, they gave me a baseline. It was like a six month baseline. And I kept getting, when I was getting closer and closer to that, I was like, okay, my hand's getting better. My face is getting better. My, you know, speech is better. My thought processing is better. And it was like memory was just not catching up. In the so, they, so basically they were saying like whatever in six months from now, whatever recovery you've it's had at that point is pretty much whatever. where you're going to, as good as it's going to get. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. And you know, it, what was weird is a, my year anniversary, I actually kind of regressed considerably, like having weird kind of relapses in a, in a sense, which is bizarre. And a lot of people, you know, I'm involved in the stroke community for advocacy and awareness. And they were telling me that's kind of how it goes. And they're like, you're a baby in this recovery. I've talked to people that have been recovering for 10, 15, 20 years. And, you're like, believe me, it seems like you've gotten over the hardest part, but you're going to go through things. I've gone through serious bouts of depression, you know, inexplicably, mm. um, r- bizarre. And I'm not like, you know, and you just, you have to tell yourself that these things, this is your brain, you know, it's playing a game with you. This isn't real. This isn't how you really feel. And I've, I wanted people to understand that, you know, even with all of this stuff, if, you know, you're tattooed or like, you go to agents and they say you're not pretty enough or, you know, I had a stroke and people question my ability to work or, you know, they're just, your mind is playing tricks on you all the time. Like those things should be challenges that you should face head on Mm -hmm. and that it shouldn't scare you. It shouldn't, you know, deter you from trying to live out your dreams because anywhere along that line, I could have been defeated. I wanted to be, you know, in a lot of ways when people, you know, or cruel to you or, you know, negative, or it seems like it's so defeating. Think of it more as an opportunity for a challenge. Like 
you shouldn't back down to those things. You Mm -hmm. should kick the door down and go for it full fledged. And that's after the stroke, I wanted to prove that more than ever, not just to myself, but to other people that go through worse things and who don't have anybody to speak for them. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to, to be that for someone that didn't have a voice. So um, that's the biggest, most profound purpose that I have in my life. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that you say that because that is something that I've definitely tried to shift my mindset towards lately. Like I don't look, I try to not look at things as problems anymore. I find that even just changing the words, yeah, you know, so instead of I have a problem, I have a challenge yeah, and everything is an opportunity to either learn about like powerlessness and letting go due to a situation because we can't change everything or, um, you know, what can I do to make changes to this situation that will make this better for me? Or like, how can I look at this from a different perspective that will change it for me? Or I think perspective has such power though, too. I mean, you can choose, I could have chosen to lay in a hospital bed and sulk and be depressed and Mm -hmm. be, I was concerned. You know, I think it's okay to acknowledge your feelings, but don't let them dictate everything because Mm -hmm. the power of your thoughts is extremely powerful um you know how we see ourselves or how we think about ourselves is powerful too um you know you have the ability to do all these things but you have to get your like you said even just how you use words to yourself to Mm -hmm. about situations there's positivity in everything if you choose to find it yeah it's a choice you know happiness is a choice all of these things, you choose your reaction, mm-hmm. you know, to things. And yeah, there's things, it's shitty, it sucks, you know, it's a bummer, but it's not permanent necessarily mm-hmm. either, right? And how you react to those things, that could be permanent. Mm-hmm. If you get into a negative mindset, like mm-hmm. you should choose to look at things positively because there's positive things about life. And the beauty is in some of the darkest moments. The strength comes from those moments. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I'm kind of experiencing that with my father right now. I know I was on the phone with caregivers right when you got here. And so my dad is 81 and has Parkinson's. And thank you. And he's been in the hospital for the last month. He comes home tomorrow. And what's been my biggest concern is that, like, I feel like him being trapped in the hospital and being trapped in the hospital bed, he had pneumonia and sepsis. And he, we've been struggling with his blood pressure, which is part of the, which is pretty much the reason that my husband and I moved in with my parents to help take care mm-hmm. of him because he was starting to fall a lot and, like, yeah. struggling, like, cognitively. Um, but I really feel that he, you know, he's not, like, really walking right now. He's not really able to get out of bed. And I feel like he's, he's kind of given up and that's what I'm so worried about because I feel like once you give up hope, like that's the end of it. it. And, and I just, Mm -hmm. and he is unfortunately that kind of person who I think like he kind of just gives in to the situation. He doesn't necessarily like, like my mom is the opposite. You know, she's, she's faced with the challenges. She's, she's like, I'm going to fight through this. I'm going to like, like she just had knee surgery, full knee replacement. She's like, I'm going to run. Oh yeah. No, she was like ignoring the fucking doctors (laughs) and like, you know, just getting up and walking around the next day and all that shit, which which she shouldn't have done to be fair. But, but yeah. And I just, I'm like, and I'm hoping that by bringing him home, Um, That will help motivate him, him, give him like just a better place to like improve his mental health. So then maybe he'll, you know, improve a little bit and um, hopefully be able to, you know, walk on his own again. But um, but it has really made me think about how your perspective and your mental health like kind of creates your reality. Yeah, it drives everything, you know. I mean, when you mentally give up you know yeah. it's a ripple effect throughout your even to your physical self mm-hmm. um and that's why even just the thought the start at the thought be like you know what i'm i'm not going to react to this negatively i'm going to look at what are the positives to this how can i use this situation to better myself and better others or be inspirational yeah. or you know put a smile on my face when i don't want to mm-hmm. those are the hardest things to do but if you do those things, those tiny little things, even just the thought, you start, you know, mimicking it. You mm-hmm. mirror it. You actually, you know what? I'm smiling so much. I am actually kind of feeling 
happier mm-hmm. I am, you know, more positive person. Like if you're conscious of what, of your thoughts and what you say and how you, you know, what you do. And I think everybody needs to work on that. You know, it's not like you just woke up one day and was like, I'm going to be really positive and empathetic. <laughs> like you, but by, you know, listening to other people and then trying to be more empathetic and mm-hmm. you open up a whole new world of peace for mm-hmm. yourself and happiness that you can also share with others. And, you know, people, that's, it's also easier too, when you deal with so much like animosity and hatred around you, Mm -hmm. you develop this sense of just like unbotheredness, like where, you know, I'm so grounded in my own, I know who I am and what I do. And I try my best to be a decent person and I'm happy and at peace. Then other people can't, you know, stir that peace um, as much as they try. And you can see it for what it is. And then it's like, I feel sorry for those people that haven't discovered the choice to be positive and to look at things God, in yeah, a positive Yeah, that's, that's so incredibly true. And I know that, I mean, I, I think about, so a lot of people know that I'm sober um, and I was sober for a long period of time and then I relapsed and then I struggled to get sober again. And, you know, I, I never, even though I definitely felt like incredibly dark and I felt frustrated and there was a part of me that's like, am I ever going to like get through this and get sober again? Because it was weird. It was like, I, because I had already been sober, I knew right. what it was like, like on the other side. The second time yeah. Order. Because I was like, I know how much yeah. better it is when I get over this hump. Yeah. I know what the other side looks in like. Mind, it's like, it's deeper yeah. this time. The yeah. Hooks are, it's I've like, done yeah. the same thing. So, um, so it was you know, but I never lost hope because I was just like, the minute I lose hope, then it's fucking it's over. over and I know it. It's over. And I remember my sponsor made me do gratitude lists. And I was like, this is the yes. stupidest shit I've ever yeah, fucking done. I don't feel stupid. grateful at all. But I had to write a gratitude, 10 things every day that I was grat- for. grateful for. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. It could be the food to eat, roof over your head. Like we all have something to be grateful for. And I would send it to her. And what it did was exactly what you said it started to create that process of change, but it was slow. Mm -hmm. And if you look at like the way that the brain works, like on a neurological level, which I know you know about, Mm -hmm. like we create these pathways in our brain, like these grooves where our thoughts will automatically go because we have those thoughts all the time. So if you're always having negative thoughts, you're going to, you're going to create these deeper and deeper pathways of negative thoughts. So you automatically go there. But if you start redirecting your thoughts down that, you know, mm-hmm. untrodden path yeah, and you start like, oh. forcing yourself to go that way more, then that pathway starts to become deeper and the other ones start to deteriorate a yeah, little bit. And it takes over. And then That's one the day one. you'll yeah. find that you automatically suddenly your reaction is become different. different. Yeah. And then your perspective changes yeah. and then everything's different. It's a beautiful realization too yeah. like it really is that's what i encourage like i hope people just even try it i actually do gratitude lists with my son every day mm-hmm. and every night before i go to bed multiple times a day i'll be driving and i'll just be like conscious to like to be thankful for things or like if i lose something and find it i'm so grateful mm-hmm. to like you know things yeah, like yeah, little yeah. things um putting ha- being grateful is a wonderful gift that you can give yourself and give to other people also you know and that's being that type of a person is wonderful you know i mean what's wrong with being like a positive positive human being because you can choose to be two things in this world and it's like why would you want to be somebody that's just riddled with hate and anger and inflicting that pain and anger and hatred onto other people yeah because you hurt people hurt you hurt people and but why choose to do that because it is ultimately a choice everyone has issues everyone deals with hurt and pain and challenges and difficulties and far worse things that you and i will ever imagine potentially you know but dealing with them is definitive of your character and Mm -hmm. therefore your impact on other people in your life, your loved ones, and just people in in general. So, so for you, who's been through so much, you know, who's been through a stroke and I know also like you have a son with disabilities, which has got to be really difficult for you. What do you find yourself grateful for? You know, I'm grateful for the opportunity to even just be sitting here having this conversation, honestly. Um, I have always said that I went through a period in my life where you have like checkpoints kind of. The first one was when my son was born and finding out that he had um, cerebral palsy. That was a truly humbling 
experience. Yeah. Um, devastating to me at, for, at first, I'll say that. Um, because you hear something like that, a diagnosis like that, and the lack of compassion that doctors have, or we were talking about earlier, yeah. like when they just deliver something like that to, I'm a single mother, you know, sitting there by myself, and they just casually come in and say something like that. It's like, what? And in my mind, I had no idea what cerebral palsy was, much like I didn't know what stroke was or signs or symptoms. How old or was he when he got the diagnosis? He was only three months old, which I'm grateful for that too, because he was diagnosed so early mm -hmm. um because i didn't know that babies like you know are supposed to use both hands laterally you know mm -hmm. like i thought he was just right hand dominant mm -hmm. he wouldn't use acknowledge or use his left side of his body at all mm -hmm. and i had no idea that that was an indicator that he had cp he had a neck thing the torticollis so their necks kind of get kinked mm -hmm. sometimes really simple you know cosmetic thing excuse me, and a physical therapist came in, worked out his neck, and she noticed it. Um, you know, so for those things, like those moments I'm grateful for because I was devastated by that. Yeah. I thought his life was over, you know, like he's never going to play football or he's never going to have a normal life, you know. Yeah. And I wanted him to have a chance yeah. at a normal life. And I realized more and more that He's a gift. Yeah. You know. So How old is he now? He's almost six. Oh, wow. He'll be six in December. You're going to make me cry, too. Well, you're making I was me like, cry, so me it's cry. too fucking late. I know. <laughs> it's true, because it, like, you know, he, um, I really, the world is so cruel, and, like, I was bullied most of my life. Still am to this day. You know, we are still. Yeah. But that's what I wanted for him, was not to have that. Yeah. And unfortunately... That's all I thought about yeah. was everyone's going to be cruel to him and all these things. But that's why it's so important to me that he knows who he is yeah, and that he's a wonderful human and not to dim. He's such a sweet little boy, mm -hmm. like not to dim his light and his, yeah. you know, his purpose in this world. And, you know, and doing so, showing him what strength looks like, but what compassion looks like also. Yeah. And it's difficult to deal with. And, you know, we went through, I've gone years and years of intensive physical. They didn't think he was going to walk at one point. You know, he had walkers and all of these surgeries. Um, he had an MRI, sedated MRI when he was six months old. And I like, I couldn't tell you how sick I was the entire yeah. time. You know, yeah. it felt like a year just sitting there waiting and this tiny little baby, you know, yeah. going in. And it's, it's challenging, but I also, I really believe that was the checkpoint too, where it humbled me, but it also made me grateful. Yeah. And grateful that it wasn't something worse. Yeah. You know, he, you know, he's, why am I, you know, being self-loathing here or, you know, why do I have to look at him even differently? Yeah. That's a societal thing, you know, that I bought into, right. you know, why does he have to, why couldn't he play football? You know, why couldn't he do these things? He can do anything he wants to do. Yeah. And so I encourage that, but that was, you know, it's a wake up call to me too to change my perspective on life and other right. people and to have more empathy and compassion for others. And, you know, that really pushed me to be that way and to try to, you know, live my life that way and teach him to be that way because yeah. it's such a more beautiful life. And, you know, there are obviously painful moments and challenges, but being able to deal with them and look at them in a beautiful way and not that it's the end of the world or negative, it's, it brings you peace. Yeah. It truly does. How's he doing now? He's so good. He's just darling. Yeah. He's in preschool. He's sassy. Man, I'm like, what? Where did these <laughs> things come from? Like, what did you just say to me? Um, it's amazing. His emotional intelligence is just incredible. It's just yeah. a sweet little boy. I can imagine. That. Oh, he's just, and he's just inherently sweet. And I love that about him. And yeah. I look at other kids, like, and I don't have anything against other people's kids, but sometimes I'm just like, he really is like a little, little gem, you know, yeah. in ways that I don't think he would be yeah, if he was quote unquote normal, you know, right. or, you know, didn't have the disability, but it's, he's a wonderful little, little guy. So I hope that he maintains that throughout yeah. his life. And I've been including him in, wrestling and youtube and stuff that i do too which people frown upon but i'm also like you know he 
if I, he's going to be in a position where people are going to be cruel to him because of what I do for a living, he's already got two strikes against him now. Yeah. Mom does porn and I have CP. I want to elevate him in, you know, in ways that are appropriate and respectful to him, but also like, I want him to have an enjoyable life and know that, you know, everything somebody says about me, it's because they're miserable human beings themselves. Right. And, you know, they're not open or they're not, you know, they're not secure enough within themselves or for whatever reason it is, they're judgmental. Um, and be like, that's okay that those people have those feelings. Don't let it hurt you. Yeah. Don't let it impact you. Yeah. Because that was the biggest loss, I think, is when people try to take away your spirit and everything that you, that is good about you because yeah. they're so cruel and yeah. evil. So don't let them. And I want to teach him that. I wish someone taught me that at that age. I want him to know, like, People can say whatever they want about you. Yeah. They can't take away who you are. Yeah. So. I mean, it's incredible that you've been through so much and you've faced so many challenges and you come out of this. I mean, you could have gone the other way, right? You could oh, be 100%. angry. You could be bitter. You could be those people that, that you know, you talk about trying to take away other people's light and you yeah. haven't. No. You've come out on the other side like a stronger woman and I think like an incredible um, role model for so many people. So thank, thank you. you. I appreciate you. You're a role model of mine too. So that means a lot to me. Because we cry here together. <laughs> it's not what I expected. I'm so reach. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's okay, man. I've had several podcasts that I've cried on. Oh God, I know. It's like, oh, I'm going to have going. to start bringing tissues. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, <laughs> you know, it's good, right? Like crying, Holly Randall crying. <laughs> that's your why that if you, yeah. you two, me, it's just what's Misha crying about now? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, there it is. <laughs> oh, perfect. Misha crying in 50 different videos. Perfect. <laughs> Never used to do that before the stroke, by the way. Like, I could contain it more. Yeah. Now it's just like, I have no emotional situation <laughs> whatsoever. It's like, okay, here it comes. Well, I think it's a good thing. Thank I think, you. you know, I mean, we're we're all holding so much inside. And sometimes you just gotta, like, yeah, let that out. Yeah, sometimes it just needs to be. And share yeah. it with, because it's, we're human. Yeah, too, you know, exactly. like that's why I have no problem with it. I used to be like, oh my god, no, no, but yeah. it's like you know, we're humans. We we have emotions and and yeah. the right to be emotional or passionate about, you know. And that's the thing too. It's like we're not necessarily crying because we're sad. It's like because it just means so much, yeah. you know. And it's yeah. like so impactful. And it can even be joy, but it's like it doesn't have to be a sad or negative thing either. Yeah. Like it's just expressive. So yeah, I, I think it's a beautiful thing. A so lot I of just things. let it go. All you know, I mean, look at you. You're a multifaceted woman. Oh, you can you. cry on a podcast about your son who you love so much, and then you can go in a death match and get hit yeah. in the head with a fucking like light tube, yeah. light tube, just, uh, and, and uh, a crazy you know, scene and, and that's just what day. being Misha Montana is all about. That's it, right there. In a nutshell, <laughs> that's literally it. <laughs> that is it. Nail on the head. Not in my head. Not in my head. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming thank on. This you, has Holly. been a really, truly enjoyable conversation. So wonderful. I'm really glad. Me too. Thank you so much for of, having me of course anytime um can you let everybody know where they can find you online yes, of course you can find me on uh, my website's mishamontana.com onlyfans.com slash mishamontana and all socials except tiktok uh the Misha Montana, fantastic. twitter and instagram fantastic and you guys can find me at holly randall on instagram and on twitter and of course if you want to support this podcast go to patreon.com slash holly randall and filtered if you're watching this on youtube like and subscribe, please. It would mean a lot to me. I just uh, hit 200,000 subscribers, which Yay, very congrats, excited about. Congrats. Thank it's great. you. you deserve Thank it. you. So, um, you know, I'm looking, I'm looking to hit that oh, million yeah. one oh, day. Yeah. Oh, it's coming, baby. Day, it's coming. So, thank you guys so much for watching. Thank I will you. see you next week.